Welcome to Volcano Tuesdays. My name is Gina and I am an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. We are a nonprofit that teaches about the science and stories of Mount St. Helens. We hope to inspire the curiosity and questions that you have about volcanoes. Our Volcano Tuesdays program includes live demonstrations of hands-on fun activities aired weekly on Tuesdays at 11. Each week, we include challenges of different levels for you to do at home, which encourage you to learn and explore. Submit to us photographs, videos, and artwork of your creations, and we will share on our Volcano Tuesday episodes each week. Tell us more about what makes you curious about volcanoes and what you hope to learn. If you're tuning in from our website or from YouTube, look for the link to submit your thoughts. In this series, we have learned about Mount St. Helens and other volcanoes around the world and about what happens when volcanoes erupt. Today we are going to focus on what happens after an eruption occurs. How do plants return to a landscape that is initially barren? Volcanic eruptions destroy habitat, but in the process they also create new habitat. After the eruption, the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, People described the area as looking like the surface of the moon. Yet, now 40 years later, we see trees, flowers, moss, and ferns. How have all of these plants returned to the landscape so quickly? Today, we will learn about one special plant that is crucial to the story. We will take a virtual field trip to Mount St. Helens and learn how to understand the role that this plant plays in the recovery and regrowth of Mount St. Helens. For today's activity, you will need some paper, could be construction paper or white paper, some cardboard, scissors, string, tape, or glue. Remember that you can follow along or pause the video at any time to gather your supplies and you can work alongside with us on the video or do the activity after the video. Let's travel to the landscape that was affected most dramatically by the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. In 1980, Mount St. Helens exploded sideways to the north. The summit or top of the volcano collapsed in a major landslide and magma beneath the surface came out in a blast that traveled 17 miles to the north, leaving us with a mountain that was a thousand feet shorter with a gaping crater in the center in an area two and a half times the size of the city of Seattle was buried with volcanic debris, the former top of the mountain. In a matter of minutes, all of the material that formed the original summit of the volcano moved down the slope and the flanks to bury this area around the north side of the volcano. We call this the blast zone. The area that was closest to the crater, directly in front of the volcano on the north side, was both buried by the landslide and then, subsequently, hot flows of ash and pumice that erupted from the volcano after the initial blast. This land once supported an old growth forest, and this forest was now buried with hundreds of feet of volcanic debris. Let's take a look at some pictures of what happened during the 1980 eruption to get a better sense of what occurred and remind ourselves of how large some of these processes are. The 1980 eruption landslide buried the area in front of the crater of Mount St. Helens with over 600 feet of volcanic debris. The extreme heat of the pyroclastic flows that surged out of the crater during this eruption sterilized the pumice plain. Not only was the former old growth forest buried with hundreds of feet of material from the landslide, but the intense heat killed all seeds and plants that were buried. In this zone, directly in front of the volcano called the Pumice Plain, nothing survived. Let's look at a few pictures of the Pumice Plain after the 1980 eruption. The 
The pumice plain is the area most dramatically affected by the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, and thus it is the area that has been most difficult for plants to regrow. Yet, just two years after the eruption in 1982, scientists were surprised to discover a small plant with purple flowers that was growing and flowering out in this area on the pumice plain. They wondered, how could this happen? This was because they had found a very special type of plant. This plant is called a lupin. Today we are going to learn about what makes the lupin so special in the story of growth and renewal at Mount St. Helens. The growth of new plants was slow because the 1980 eruption left no seeds or plant roots in the soil for new plants to grow from. Also, the volcanic debris that covered the ground did not contain organic material such as leftover plants, roots, or plant parts in the soil to provide nutrients for new plants to grow. So how surprised were the scientists when they found a lupin plant on the pumice plain? Let's take a closer look at what the volcanic debris from the 1980 eruption looks like and think about how it may be conducive or not conducive for plants to grow. Hi everyone, welcome to the north side of Mount St. Helens. We have taken a field trip here to visit part of the mountain that came down during the 1980 eruption. In 1980, we had a mountain with a conical top. During the May 18th, 1980 eruption, the top of Mount St. Helens fell off in a massive landslide. I like to picture it as if I had a bowl with a complex ice cream sundae. Over time, I put things into my sundae, maybe peanut butter cups and chocolate chips. Similarly, Mount St. Helens is a volcano that had built up from many eruptions over time. Successive eruptions deposited layers and that created a large sundae or a large volcano. Well, in 1980, it was like someone suddenly tipped the sundae bowl and the top of the mountain and the flanks of the mountain slid off in a massive eruption. We are standing at a location seven miles from the crater of Mount St. Helens, yet the material behind me was thrust out during the massive landslide of the 1980 eruption. We can see there are layers of past lava flows, old rocks that form from the older eruption of Mount St. Helens. There's a layer of gray, and then on top of that, a layer of darker red and dark gray. All of these layers represent past eruptions. Similarly, in our analogy of ice cream, the different layers of toppings that we would have in our ice cream sundae. During the 1980 eruption, this material moved fast in a matter of minutes, it traveled tens of miles away from the volcano and left large chunks spread across the landscape. During the 1980 eruption, the top and flanks of the mountain came down in a massive landslide. This landslide traveled far from the crater of the volcano and traveled over 14 miles. We can see the hunk of material behind me is a chunk of the former mountain. All of this represents a chunk of former lava flows that now stands as this massive mound or hill. We call this a hummock, and hummocks are characteristic of deposits formed by landslides from volcanic eruptions. Because again, this material coming off our volcano is not all the same size, or even it is like a complex ice cream sundae with chunks and layers of different sizes and different parts. And so when in 1980 that material came down off the mountain, it left a deposit with all of these mounds, and some of these mounds we can see are incredibly high. An exciting part though about being here in front of this hummock deposit is the fact that behind me on the top, we can see there are plants growing back, and this is very exciting. It has been 40 years since the mountain erupted in 1980, yet now see there are trees and flowers growing back. I feel so lucky to be here in front of this hummock deposit at Mount St. Helens. 
partially because I am able to stand next to an old piece of the former mountain and its past history, but I also am able to witness the new and present history and future to come happening as plants grow back on top of this hummock. One day, this will be covered with soil and plants and it will be much harder to see this landslide deposit. But because of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens and the fact that these hummock deposits were so fresh and obvious in the landscape as these lumps, scientists are able to better understand the processes that occurred in past eruptions of other volcanoes. Thank you so much for joining me here at this virtual trip to a hummock in the landslide deposit at Mount St. Helens. We can see that a volcanic eruption creates a tough environment for plants to grow in. One element though that we cannot see with our eyes is the chemistry. Volcanic debris does not have the proper nutrition for plants. Just like people, plants need the proper balance of nutrients to grow. These nutrients include elements such as potassium, carbon, sodium, and nitrogen. Some of these elements come from volcanic rocks and ash, but some of them also come from living things like plants and bacteria. The volcanic rocks from Mount St. Helens are rich in certain elements like calcium, potassium, and sodium, but they contain almost none of some of the most important elements that plants need in their nutritional balance. Specifically, they contain almost no nitrogen. To allow plants to grow after a volcanic eruption, there must be a way to add nitrogen to help to turn the volcanic debris into soil that is fertile for plants to grow. Volcanic eruptions destroy habitat, but in the process they create new habitat. The 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens buried the old growth forest with hundreds of feet of volcanic debris. This rock and ash was not initially a fertile place for plants to grow. Why are lupins such special heroes in the story of the regrowth and renewal of life at Mount St. Helens? That is because the lupin plant has a superpower in the plant world. That is, they are chemical laboratories that can create nitrogen in a form that plants can use to grow. How do lupin plants achieve this? Lupin plants have a special relationship with bacteria in their roots, which converts nitrogen in the air into a form of nutri nutrients that can be used by plants. Slowly, over time, by adding nitrogen to the soil, Lupin plants help to transform sterile volcanic debris into fertile soil. Yes, we are talking about chemistry, and what to do if no one laughs at your chemistry jokes? Well, you keep telling them until you get a reaction. Today, the area within the 1980 blast zone of Mount St. Helens, and especially on the pumice plain, is covered with many, many lupins. Purple lupins carpet the landscape in front of the volcano with beautiful flowers. The lupins tend to bloom at the same time, so if you visit Mount St. Helens in the summer, you can look forward to seeing a carpet of purple. Let's take a look at a video taken by one of my coworkers of a bee pollinating lupin flowers at Mount St. Helens. This video is taken this week, the first week of June. So beautiful. Our activity today is to draw the parts of a lupin plant and to cut and hang them together to build a mobile. You can print a worksheet with a template on our website both in color and as a black and white coloring sheet, or follow with us and draw your own. Together by drawing, let's learn about the parts of a lupin. For today's activity, you will need paper, coloring supplies, string, and scissors. Remember, you can pause the video at any time to gather your supplies. Today we are going to learn about one very important plant at Mount St. Helens called the lupin. 
The name lupin comes from the Latin word lupus, meaning wolf, because the people who named this plant originally thought that it stole nutrients from other plants. We know that lupins, in fact, do the opposite and provide nutrients to other plants. Let's draw together the parts of a lupin starting with the leaves. The leaves are called palmates because they are shaped wide open like the palm of a hand with branching smaller parts called leaflets. Next, let's draw the flower stalk. Lupins are in a family of plants called the pea family. Their flowers are shaped similar to that of other peas, like the snap peas that we might grow in our gardens. After flowering, the flowers turn into little pea pods. Each pod contains a pea inside, which is the seed. Note that not all plants in the pea family are edible, so even though lupin seeds look like the peas that we eat, it is important not to eat them without proper identification. Let's draw the roots of a lupin plant. These roots are relatively long and thin and contain distinct little round lumps or nodes called nodules. These nodules are where the bacteria live in the roots. Remember, bacteria are incredibly tiny, so tiny as not to be visible without high-powered microscopes. Yet on the roots of these plants, we can see these lumps because there are so many bacteria living. Next, we are going to draw a few other leaves for our lupin plant. The lupin leaves tend to have a central vein that runs down each leaflet, like spokes on a wheel. Each leaflet is oval shaped with a point at the end. Our next step is to begin to color in our lupin flowers. The flowers range from dark purple to light purple and white. I'm going to use watercolor pencils and then a paintbrush to color the flowers in different shades of purple. You can use whatever coloring supplies you have at home. Next, let's color in the leaves. Lupin leaves tend to have a green-blue color. I'm going to achieve this color by mixing different colors of green and then painting it in. Scientists in the Pacific Northwest did an experiment studying how a forest, after being logged, gained back its nitrogen. They found that lupin plants, which made up only a small fraction of the plants in the forest, less than 1%, contributed to one third of the nitrogen that was brought into the forest each year. Scientists believe that the wind or perhaps the scat or poop of deer, birds, elk, and gophers dropped lupin seeds onto the pumice plain of Mount St. Helens. Once the first lupin plants established, they created habitat for more plants to grow. The nitrogen from the roots, nodules, and the bacteria made the soil more fertile for other plants. Now, let's take our illustration and turn it into a hanging mobile. I'm going to cut out each part of my lupin drawing, including the title. I drew my drawing on thicker watercolor paper, but if you use thinner paper, you can glue each component of your drawing to cardboard or cardstock to give it a bit more structure. You can go into as much detail with cutting out each component as you like. Here I'm leaving a white border around each of my illustrations. Next, I'm going to thread yarn or string through each drawing so that each part of the lupin flower will hang, starting with the title, then I will hang the flower stalk, the leaves, and the roots. I'm using the tip of a pencil to poke holes into the paper and threading the yarn through these holes. You can thread your components together in whatever way you like. Just be careful if you are using something sharp. Once all of the pieces are assembled, I'm ready to display. There's no right or wrong way to hang your pieces together. I'm going to hang my leaves so that they sit next to each other on either side of the flower stalk but you can hang all of your components in a straight line or whatever arrangement is fun to you. The 
the final piece of my mobile of the roots. Once all of the pieces are assembled, I'm ready to display and hang my mobile. Holding it up against the backdrop of my garden, I can see all of the parts of this plant, including its special roots. Here is my lupin mobile, nicely done. Our challenges today are for you to bake your own lupin plant mobile and hang in a special place in your home. Or to learn about another plant that is special to you and find out why it is special perhaps to other plants as well. Research its superpower, draw it, maybe build a similar mobile and take a picture, send it to us, let us know what you learned. We at the Mount St. Helens Institute are excited that you were able to tune in for this episode of Volcano Tuesdays. We work to inspire curiosity about Mount St. Helens through field trips, outdoor school, and summer camps. Consider donating to us to support this programming into the future. A huge thank you also to our supporters and partners. We partner with the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, and Discover Your Northwest. We also have an amazing set of hundreds of volunteers and program participants like you that make our programs possible. Thank you so much for tuning in for this activity and we look forward to seeing you next time.